Babblebrook. What are you doing here? Touchberry in particular says, let's just leave. Count Kilmarnock is fomenting a rebellion against the king. Cross the babbling brook. He's clearly in charge. The Reeve, who are you? Where do you come from? Who do you serve? Is there a problem? We're all friends here, aren't we? Let's just kill him. Let's just kill him. We're gonna order food and it'll come and it'll be poisoned. Help us! They head in that direction. It's the Reeve. He's changed. Yeah, that's probably what's happening. The Reeve killed a man. Killed a man. Killed a man. Killed a man. Let's go kill him. Let's just go kill him. Players are very confident at this point. They're going to have breakfast. The Reeve is a drinker. And they see other guards now and then pass through the square on their way someplace. Jewelers, gemologists shop. An elderly man. Burr, 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 burly guy. Have you found treasures? Is that why you're here? No, I have no idea what country he comes from. I, no. The Reeve has been selling gems, selling gems, selling gems. Hmm. The Reeve's been selling a lot of gems. That's interesting. Um, all right. Uh, we need to stock up on our food. We need to, to replenish our, our uh, supplies. We need to replenish our, our, our rations. Where can we find some food? Well, it's not like there's a rations store, right? People aren't selling MREs. There's no place selling boxes of granola bars. So what they're going to have to do is find dried meat, dried fruits, dried berries, things like that, grains that will keep things that they can bring with them, um, hard tack, that kind of stuff. So they're going to have to go to a number of places. They ask around a little bit. People, again, are a little wary of them. It's elves and a halfling, right? Fofire tries to do most of the talking, but the sword and the bow with the dragon heads on it, I mean, they're kind of conspicuous, right? But they finally get from people that down along the river is where you can buy the food. Farmers from their area bring their food there to be shipped down to Kamoik. Other food comes in from other places and is warehoused there. That's the best place. That's where they sell food. Okay, down there they go. They find a number of places. They get some meat. They get some, some bread, some hardtack kind of bread. Lembus bread. One bite will keep a grown man going all day. How many did you eat? Anyway, they find that kind of stuff. Then they go to a place to get some dried fruits. There's a place that has, you know, apricots and whatnot, all that kind of stuff. My youngest especially wanted apricots. He, he likes them in real life, so Bob Johnny likes them in, in the game. Anyhow, they get that kind of stuff there. While they're there, the proprietor, a large man, very friendly, very jovial, a large man is talking with another customer. Oh, if you ask me, the Reeve trouble started with that Count, that Count Kilmarnock. He wants to take over this area, he does. I hear he wants to buy up Babblebrook. <laughs> they don't have no good farming up there. Need some decent farmland. He thinks he can extend his borders a little south, you know. <laughs> Eat us up. Oh, Reeve doesn't want that. He's loyal to the Baron, he is. Now, that's what's got him all on edge. It's that Count. Okay, so apparently some version of the Count's plans is actually known, although not quite accurate it it's in the ballpark. All right. They buy their stuff and go. And further down the way, they pass a vegetable seller, right? They're not going to get any vegetables because those aren't going to last very well. But as they're passing, there's a voice from inside. Hey, you lot! You lot! You're those onion sellers, aren't you? You're the onion sellers come through the other day. Uh, yes, we had a cargo of, of onions. We did. Oh, a lot of trouble you caused. There was a group came after you. They were armed men. They were dangerous looking. What do you mean armed men? Dangerous looking? What are you talking about? Oh, rough men. Trying to cover themselves up with cloaks so no one saw what I saw. They had a livery on. They did. They were someone's troops. Don't know whose. What was the color of the livery? It was silver and red. What do you want to know for? Okay, it's not Count Kelmarnock. He's black and gold. It's not the Baron. He's blue and white. Red and silver. Hmm. Just move on, you lot. We got plenty of our own produce here. Don't need you lot around. Not a friendly place. They're beginning to wonder if they even want to help this village. <laughs> they decide they will, but they're grumpy about it. All right. It's around noon, and they need to eat at some point, and then go back to the jewelers. They decide not to go to an inn for their meal. They've 
not had a great welcome so far at any of the businesses, so they decide they're going to just use some of their rations and sit in the square and eat there, right? They're sitting near that water trough thing. They just sit on the ground and they start, you know, sharing out the rations. They're eating their meal when they notice Fofire sees in a doorway across the square a man watching them. He's trying to hide in the shadows of a doorway, uh, unsuccessfully, and he's watching them. Okay, this again, someone following us. Fleetwood wants nothing to do with this. He says, all right, we're almost finished. Great. Pack up the food. Let's go. And they walk across the square right up to the man, who, as he sees them coming, panics a bit and slips out of the doorway and around the corner. Now it's a pursuit. After him! Up to the corner of the square they go. The man has dodged around the corner to the north, and they follow. And they find themselves in a constricted laneway. It's not quite an alley, but it's not quite a street. The man is nowhere to be seen. There are a couple of other people in this little laneway, but there's not a lot of businesses here. There are boarding houses here. Uh, there are private homes here. There are some businesses, but they tend to be like alchemist shop kind of things, where you go in and up, there's not a lot of street trade happening. So it's quiet. It's shaded. And I tell them as I paint the picture of this alleyway that where the buildings come together, sometimes there's a gap, maybe a foot or two, maybe three, little laneways, little alleyways that go back into the interior. And so they explore their way down. In fact, Fleetwood even says he's checking for secret doors. So I'm rolling. There aren't any secret doors, but I'm rolling as if there are, just because he doesn't know that. Eventually they come to a laneway, it's a little bit wider, and they look down it, and they can see at the end the Reeves hold, his building. And they recognize it because of the, the stone on the ground floor and half timber above that and the shingled roof. It was distinctive. Let's check this alleyway. As they go down it, these alleyways are used for storage. So there'll be a barrel or two here or there, empty barrels that have been used and, and have to be taken back to the vintner kind of thing, right? They come to a place where there's a stack of crates, most of them half broken apart, clearly, you know, going to be used for wood at some point or sent back to whoever filled them the first time, you know, to get more goods, whatever. Here they're all stacked. As they pass by, they are overwhelmed by a stench. A smell hangs in the air. I say it is the worst thing you have smelled since the troglodyte. It's wretched, awful, rotting meat. Ugh. Disgusting. Rotting meat? Well, let's keep moving. Fofire says, no, we should check this out. Little metagaming happening there, let's face it, but okay, you're going to check it out. Well, is the smell, is it from the boxes? Well, you sniff around and, yeah, it's a lot stronger by the pile of crates. Now, can we see anything behind them? Can we look around them? They're stacked very close together. They're tightly packed really quite tightly packed for a bunch of old, empty crates. Okay, well, let's move some. You pull one out, and from behind it, <laughs> drops a hand. Doop! Weapons out! Is it going to attack? No. No, it's just laying there, not moving. Oh, that's where the smell's coming from, all right. The flesh is beginning to putrefy. This is a body, and it's been here for a while. The sleeve on the arm finishes in a ruffled cuff. Very fancy. Hmm. Move another box. To which Touchberry says, Nope, nope, don't move any boxes. Cover them back up. Let's just leave. Let's just get out of here. <laughs> no, no, no. His brothers want to investigate them. Fine. Move another box. The more they move, I say, the more you move the boxes, you are exposing more of this body. The clothing is rich. It's fancier clothing fine fabric. Then you uncover the face. It is a face you recognize, despite the swelling, despite the condition of it. It's the Reeve. Then they get it. Doppelganger. <laughs> okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? A doppelganger has come, killed the Reeve, taken his spot. All right, what are we dealing with here? He could be anyone. Is he you? No, it's me. Well, yeah, that's what a doppelganger would say, isn't it? Anyhow, what are we going to do? we got to think this through. we got to be clever about this. What are we going to do? They decide to cover the body back up. We won't deal with that right now because we have an appointment 
to go get 1,045 gold pieces from the gemologist. No matter what happens, they remember the cash. So before doing anything else, they stop in at the gemologist's and they finish the transaction. There's a little bit of the odor of rotten meat hanging on them because they've just been dealing with a dead body and the, the gemologist is, oh, what have you been in? <laughs> they get their money, thank him. Anytime you find jewels in this area, you, you feel free to come. <laughs> Out they go, back to the square. Okay, <sighs> what are we gonna do? Well, confront the Reeve, obviously, the, the, the Reeve. We gotta confront him. Clearly, we've got enough evidence, something's going on, if not a doppelganger or some, you know, long-lost twin or something, something's going on, we've got to go confront him. And Touchberry, particularly, having been denied, you know, just leaving town and, and, and getting out of the whole thing, fine, then let's go, you know, hit someone. All right, let's go. They approach the Reeves' hold, and Fleetwood makes like he's just gonna walk right in. The guards are still there, and as he walks up, they cross their spears. No admittance. Reeve's orders. Well, I don't obey the Reeve, says Fleetwood, and today, neither do you. Sleep. And down they go. He had rolled like 10 or 12 hit dice worth of, of creatures would go down, so it was no problem. Thump, right? In they go. In the room, they find the guard captain and two other guards sitting having their own noon meal. They look up as they enter, and they can see the legs of the, the guards, you know, outside. They assume they've been killed. Up they get, weapons out. No time for talking. Battle on. Roll initiative. This fight is a lot harder than it should have been. These guards only have two hit dice. Um, they are wearing leather armor, so it's an AC7. There's no dex bonuses. The captain has a dex bonus of one and a strength bonus of one. And they're armed with normal swords, so 1d8. Um, no shields. It should be a cakewalk, really, but it ends up being really tough, and they get into some trouble here. Fofire swings first and misses badly. The guard she tried to hit attacks her and hits. And here I remind you, they are low in hit points. You know, low 20s, even one in the high teens. So, you know, this is edgy for them, and it ends up being very dangerous. Bob Johnny and Touchberry square off against the captain. Full Fire and Fleetwood go one on one with the other two guards. They're having a lot of trouble. Eventually, one guard goes down dead, and finally, finally, Bob Johnny, who had been missing and missing and missing and missing, and I don't know why he didn't cast Webb or Fleetwood or something, but anyhow, he'd been missing, finally. He hits with that axe, and he had, he had, you know, invoked the fire, Brasinga! And so the fiery axe comes sweeping through, and finally down goes the captain. He'd taken some damage earlier, they'd, you know, gotten three points, two points kind of thing. Finally, takes down the captain. At which point I roll a, a morale for the other guard, the remaining guard. He gets it, though, he's gonna fight on. All of this commotion, of course, is heard upstairs, and down the stairs in the corner comes the Reeve. Now, he's, again, a portly fellow. He's not what you'd call athletic, but he moves surprisingly quickly for a man of his size because, of course, he's not a man of his size. He's a doppelganger. Whips out a dagger, enters the fray. During the combat, the cut, the thrust, the back, the forth, the Reeve changes. No longer the Reeve, he alters right in front of their eyes and becomes the captain of the guard, you know, who's lying dead on the floor, right? So he assumes a more powerful, more nimble shape. The fight continues. This one guard is really holding out. Fofire is not having any luck with the guy. He, she's hit him a couple of times, but it's not going well. Then we hit the threshold. I had set a threshold for the doppelganger that when he got down to a certain level, and I think it was eight hit points. If he got to eight hit points or lower, he would run. And I chose eight because there would be, if there was a perfect hit from, from, from Faux Fire with her long sword, her normal sword, if there was a perfect hit from Faux Fire, that would kill him. So there would be the option that he might be taken out, but it wouldn't be low enough that it would be a guaranteed death. Like he wasn't going to be easily killed. He could still get away with some health. Anyhow, he gets down. He's actually brought down to seven. He boots it out the back door. There's a back door to the building. It heads into a courtyard behind the building where that alleyway is. The alleyway leads to the courtyard. 
so they know where it's going. Fleetwood says, go after him. He shifts over to the remaining guard to fight him. The others go out the door. As they enter the courtyard, they see a section of what looked like fence slammed shut. It actually was a gate, but you wouldn't know it just to look at it. So I guess there was kind of a secret door. Anyhow, they see it slam shut, though, and they follow, and they pursue down a small alleyway, out onto a street, and they can see the captain of the guard, actually the doppelganger, of course, booting it to the square, and they follow. Across the square they run. As the captain of the guard runs, he shouts, Guards! Guards! Help! Help! They've killed the Reeve! Help! Ah, not so stupid, this doppelganger. There are some other guards within hearing, and they come into the square, see what's happening, and rush to intercept. They crash in to the three pursuers and combat. Roll for initiative. The guards actually get it, and they have some blows in at first, and it's starting to look a little bad for Bob Johnny. But the fight continues, and they eventually do overpower the guards, but by then... The captain of the guard has gone. Now they can see, they watched him go, and they saw where he went. He ran to the riverfront and over a small footbridge. Now, meanwhile, Fleetwood, back at the Reeves hold, has been fighting this remaining guard, does eventually defeat him, um, and he decides for his last blow, instead of a killing blow, he's going to say, can I knock him out? First he asks, can I knock, knock him to the ground? All right, can I just knock him to the ground? I say, yeah. Make it a normal attack roll, and you're going to need to get, you know, two over the normal to, to hit. You're going to need to get two over in order to, to hit in a way that will accomplish a specific thing. Fine. Okay. He knocks him to the ground. He rolls it easy, like he rolls a 19 or something. Knocks him to the ground. Then he says, I want to knock him out. I don't want to kill him, but can I hit him with a pommel of my sword? Again, I say, yep, yeah, you can. Make a normal attack roll, and I've got a number that if you cross, it kills him. If you hit it, it knocks him out. If you're under it, it just does some damage. Okay? He rolls it, and he lands in the range where it will knock him out. You've knocked him out. Actually, he may be dead. You don't know. But he's not moving, at any rate. Fleetwood gets up, runs out the front door past the sleeping guards to join his friends because he could hear through the open door, he could hear the combat happening out in the square. There he runs, and he comes across his friends just as they're finishing the combat with the other two guards. And he just keeps going because he can also see the captain running and they all keep going and boot it toward the river, across the bridge. As they run, I say, you can see ahead of you the captain of the guard, the doppelganger, sprinting along and as he does, he jumps and mid-jump, he transforms into a panther. <laughs> They say, faux fire, faux fire, shoot him, shoot him with your bow. But by the time she unslings that bow, gets an arrow knocked, he's going to be way out of range. Is he in magic missile range? Yes. Bob Johnny speaks the arcane words. The arrow materializes next to him, and he points, and it streaks, hits the panther, which yelps, but keeps running. Remember, he was down to seven. Bob Johnny rolls for damage. He rolls a four. It's five. The thing still has two hit points. God bless Beck me. It doesn't matter how low your hit points are. If you have one hit point, you're still alive. So he charges off toward the snare wood. He's heading for that forest. The characters pursue. This is the DM trying to rescue his whole snare wood side quest. It came to me when he was running and when they didn't catch him in the square. So I kind of thought that he'd run away, there'd be a big fight in the square, but then I thought, no, 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 even better. He'll run to the snare wood. Then we can play the adventure I designed. <laughs> Manipulative quantum snare wood. Anyway, the panther runs into the snare wood. The characters pursue. As soon as they enter the woods, they feel themselves surrounded by this pulsing life. Now, there aren't as many leaves on the trees here, of course, because winter has set in. There's a number of evergreens mixed in, but even still, without the leaves, without the foliage, there's a darkness and shadow at work here. And as you enter, you can hear a whispering all around you, like messages being passed from branch to branch, tree to tree. There's a sense of 
some presence, but ahead of you, you can see the panther dodging between the trees going further into the snare wood. Let's go, they say. On they charge. They break into a clearing, and stepping from behind a tree is this guy. A satyr steps out, sword at his side, flute in his hands, and says, What are you doing in the Coyle du Mer? We made him at Vacation Bible School.